and you had chapter eight, homework number one. Did I, I didn't share, that's why it was weird. Okay, there we go. Explain the electronegativity trends across a row and down a column of the periodic table. Compare these trends with those of ionization energies and atomic radii. How are they all related? All right, remember what I said to you when we were going over the test uh, on our last Zoom? You cannot answer a problem that says something about which has a higher electronegativity, justify your answer. You can't just say fluorine because it's in the upper right corner. You have to say it in full sentence. You have to say it is a periodic trend that electronegativity increases as you go across a row and it is a periodic trend that electronegativity increases as you go up a column. You can't just say as you go over and as you go up because they don't give credit for that. And so therefore I took off points from your test for that because I specifically told you, you have to tell me it, that it's a periodic trend or you have to explain the concept, all right? Here, we're just supposed to explain how it relates to the other ones. So we can say that electronegativity, ionization energy, and electron affinity increase as you go this way and as you go this way. Meanwhile, atomic radii decreases as you follow those trends. And we're supposed to recognize why those four things go together. Or I should say, why do the three green things go with the pink thing? And you're gonna say, because the smaller the atom gets, the harder it is to take an electron off of it. That means higher ionization energy. The smaller an atom gets, the more excitedly it can add electrons to it. That's the electronegativity and, and electron affinity. Right, so that would be explaining it by concept, but you can state it by trend. Make sure that you know these are the trends that all go together and then you're good. You're good on periodic trends. Um, I've got most of them here. The only one that's not listed here is electron affinity, but we did make this little graph. It's an ugly picture here on uh, class on uh, Interwrite, but on your um, Google slides, it looks good. You can see this pretty well. Question number two, explain the difference between the following terms, electronegativity and electron affinity. I almost use those two terms interchangeably because they're very, very similar. But electron affinity is more a measurement of energy and then therefore tends to be more about ions. And electronegativity tends to be more about covalent bonds. Covalent, okay? So this is dealing with the sharing and not, necessary, not necessarily sharing equally. And this is more about when you have an atom that gains an electron and becomes an ion and therefore actually exothermically loses energy in the process. But the two terms are almost interchangeable, okay? A covalent bond versus a polar covalent bond. We could explain that one by example. If you had HH versus HF, here you would say this is a polar bond and this is just a covalent bond in general. In fact, maybe we could even go so far as to say this is a nonpolar covalent bond. Uh, polar covalent bond, so if we stay with the HF, ah, HF, I guess I could have used HCl too, versus NaCl, the fact that these don't share electrons, they actually transfer the electron over from the sodium to the chlorine and form ions. And then we can say that uh, the strength of this ionic bond is most likely, notice I didn't say is always, is most likely stronger than this covalent bond, than this sharing, okay? It would be easier to rip that apart than it would be to rip apart the ionic bond. But it's not always true. Um, so it's just in general. Um, here's some nice pictures to show you what it is I was talking about. Question number three, uh, without using the electronegativity difference table, predict the, 
I can't see it. It's underneath the thing there. Predict the blank of increasing electronegativity in each of the following groups of elements. Okay, so this is just us looking at um, predict the order of increasing. It's just which one has the highest electronegativity. This is a pretty easy question, right? So for carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, we recognize that it increases as you go to the uh, to the right, but you can't just say that. You have to say it is a periodic trend that electronegativity increases as you go across a period. Now you get full credit. Um, between sulfur, selenium, and chlorine, now you got to include both trends because it's going to increase as you go towards chlorine. Uh, silicon, germanium, and tin, you're going to say that silicon is the highest because it increases. It is, it is a periodic trend that electronegativity increases as you go up a group and so on and so forth. So you get the idea. Let's just give you the answers to get out of this. I just put some numbers uh, by them. Question number four, uh, without using the table, um, try to decide which would be the most polar between carbon. Yeah, you guys had a lot of writing on your last chapter test. I thought the last chapter test was gonna be quick. And then we got into about 55 minutes of tests. And I'm like, wow, I still haven't gotten any yet. And then I started getting the first tests from you and they all came in a big wave. And then as I looked at them, as I, you know, I send you the got it thanks to make sure everything's there. I'm like, wow, you guys put a lot of writing on the paper, which is impressive. That is exactly what you have to do. You have to write, write, write. So yeah, it's kind of a hand cramp, especially when you guys don't have to do so much writing anymore. Uh, so we're comparing those, we're comparing these and we're comparing these. And so oh, I suppose to use a different color for that. So we would say that probably the germanium fluorine uh, bond would be the most polar because they're the furthest apart from each other. Um, so the same thing all the way through, just look to see who's the furthest apart from each other. So here we would say phosphorus and chlorine, nah, that's just messy. So in number two or letter B, I should say, we would say that phosphorus and chlorine are further apart than sulfur and chlorine. Um, in letter C, I think we're gonna probably say anything with fluorine is gonna be higher. And then the last one, um, titanium, I probably was supposed to be saying um, thallium or something, but it doesn't matter, whatever's furthest. So I'm gonna say right there, if it is supposed to be titanium. Um, yeah, so it doesn't matter. Okay, and then question number five, I did have at least one person ask me about what do we do on number five. On number five, we're actually supposed to look at the electronegativity difference between the different elements. So I'm gonna just skip right to number four because this is usually the way this is formatted, is for number five is, is uh, re-answering number four in terms of the electronegativity differences. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the numbers. So for carbon, it's a 2.5 and for fluorine, it's a 4.0. Take the larger number minus the smaller number to find out the electronegativity difference, in this case, 1.5. 1.5 is less than 1.67, so I'm gonna assume that this is covalent, but because it is two different elements, it's really, it's polar covalent. All of these are polar covalent, um, and we're just looking for the biggest difference in numbers. It turns out that silicon and germanium actually have the same uh, electronegativity and so you end up with the same values for those two. Then going down to letter B for number four, uh, phosphorus to chlorine versus sulfur to chlorine doing the same thing. All of these are, well, nope, nope, these are not covalent. These are ionic, aren't they? They're greater than 1.67. Now, why would they include ionic uh, electronegativities that create ionic bonds in a problem like this that was supposed to be talking about covalent? Because Nothing is completely one other than a, like a hydrogen hydrogen bond that is 100% covalent. There is no ionic tendency to this. But once you have a, um, a polar situation, there still is a certain degree of ionicness to it. The magic number is 1.67, but it's really, you know, if you're less than 1.67, then you're covalent. And if you're greater than 1.67, you're ionic. But that's just a general rule. It just means that the 
further above it you are, the more ionic you are, and the further below it you are, the more covalent you are, but you still have tendencies towards both, okay? So when we say that silicon and fluorine forms an ionic bond, that doesn't mean that at some points in time, they're actually sharing those pair of electrons. That's weird, that's confusing, but it, it is what it is. Nobody's gonna ask you about that anyway. And then the part C and D for this one, um, same thing. Um, the titanium to chlorine bond there, I would have guessed that to be ionic. If that's truly what this was supposed to be, that's a metal with a non-metal, I would have guessed it to be ionic. But its number is less than 1.67, so we would say the bond is more covalent than it actually is ionic. But nobody's going to ask us that unless they give us the numbers. Okay. All right, we should end because it's already 8.28. That gives you two minutes to go on a potty break and then you guys have three sets of videos to watch. It doesn't take long. Please remember also, let's go back to the calendar. So I'm gonna stop the share real quick that today is the 